say welcome this morning to Fresh Start, another opportunity to stand and do the will of the Father. We thank the Lord for this opportunity to, to do His will and to teach the Word of God in spirit and in truth. This morning we will not be in our Genesis Bible study this morning, uh, but we have another thought on our heart and on our mind. And uh, if you would this morning, turn with us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll get started in God's Word. While you're turning, we'll ask Father for his blessings. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another opportunity, Father, and that to stand and do thy will. We ask, Father, that you would open eyes and open ears to your word this morning. Allow your word to land on fertile ground. And Father, let it prosper so that many would be aware, Father, of these things that are coming in this near future. Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you do and all that you teach. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. We have a thought this morning about, I, I have been speaking with a lot of different uh, people over the last month, per se, and uh, many people are uh, still so stuck on a rapture theory. And uh, we know that a lot of the scriptures that we'll be using this morning, the the students of God's word that uh, understand God's plan and that are prepared. These are familiar scriptures, and it won't be something new to you. Uh, but we have need net to bring out some things, and uh, we just ask that uh, the Lord be our helper, amen, and uh, that uh, we, we do our best to try to convince those that are stuck in a slumber. We ask that uh, you follow along with us this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And now, this is the scripture that a lot of your rapturists will use. Uh, they'll use this scripture proclaiming uh, the coming of the Lord. And uh, they proclaim that where Christ would come, uh, well, I guess pre, uh, pre-advanced to his coming, and uh, the, it, the, the, the word doesn't teach us that. The word teaches us actually just the opposite, but uh, where man's traditions have come in and where man has taken God's word and twisted it instead of conforming to the words like it ought to, um, it's important that you take a Strong's exhaustive concordance and you utilize it when you study to help you to understand the words that have been translated from the Greek or from the Hebrew and been translated into the English. And the words have a way of losing meaning. And uh, it's important that we get the, the meat of the word. We understand exactly what Father is trying to tell us. You see, Father has prepared for us a way and that of protection. During this hour of temptation, during this uh, great tribulation to come. But if one doesn't know how these events will transpire, then they will be very vulnerable to the Antichrist and to his horde of angels that will come with him. And it's important that we teach along these lines. And you say, well, uh, is that... Uh, is that what the, the Church of Smyrna and Church of Philadelphia taught? Well, they teach exactly whom the Kenites are. And uh, it's important that we uh, highlight and uh, understand who the Kenites are and then um, how these angelics are going to come and when they're going to come. But if you'll turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we'll start our reading in verse 13. In verse number 13, it says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. What Paul is doing here, he's, after the first uh, 12 verses, he's speaking there about how that they ought to conduct themselves as believers and uh, the hope that they have in, uh, in, in Christ. But he also, when he gets into verse 13, Paul's now removing the fear that comes to an unbeliever. He wants to bring out exactly how the dead are taken and where they are. And that's what the scripture here is about. It's not 
set in place to exhort a rapture theory. These scriptures are made for you to understand. This scripture here is to understand exactly where the dead are, where those loved ones uh, that have gone on before us, where they are, and what they will be doing, and what their position will be at the coming of the Lord. So it says again, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now this word asleep, in your Strong's, in the Greek, it's 2837, and it means to decease, and that's exactly what it means. Those that have deceased, and he says that, I, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He's talking about the Gentiles. These Gentiles have no hope. They have no uh, understanding that uh, the soul of a man continues to live, even after the flesh body is gone, even after one has lost their life, Ecclesiastes 12 and 7, the Bible tells us that the spirit goes directly back to the fodder. How quick will that happen, Brother Randall? Man, I mean to tell you, it's instant. It's right at the very instant that they give up the spirit that they go back to the fodder. And they're not out in the ground. Uh, they're not in a hole in the ground, out into the weather and the things of that nature. And I believe that's what Paul was trying to convince the people of of uh, Thessalonica, uh, of that, that they should have hope and believe. Now, he says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, this is our example, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. When God comes at the last trump, when Christ comes, at the last trump, at the seventh trump. In other words, the furthest trump out. When Christ comes, these will come with him. Those that are in Christ. Those that have known the Lord and had repented uh, up to the day that they uh, uh, had deceased and uh, they were prepared in that to live in the kingdom with the Lord. You say, well, where is that at, Brother Randall? Well, the Bible teaches us that uh, in the book of the Revelation, in chapter number 11, Excuse me, chapter 19. I apologize. I had my mind on something else and I knew that wasn't right. Revelation chapter 19. And it says here that in verse 14, he says, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. These armies are those deceased that have gone on before you and I. In other words, that what it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52 and so on, it talks of that, how that some have passed and they will be uh, awakened. In other words, they will come with the Lord as the word speaks. But those that are remain on earth, still in the flesh, that we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. The misconception is, is on down here in verse 17. So let's continue on. In verse number 15, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now this word prevent needs your strongs to convey to you, to make you understand exactly what he's saying. In other words, he's saying here that that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not. Now, this word prevent is in your strongs in the Greek 5348. And it means to go before. Okay? So, if we read it like that, the Lord shall not go before them which are asleep. We will not go before them. There will not be a transformation or a... Uh, a calling away or a 
any moment doctrine used in that. And Christ has plainly told us that we are to wait upon him. Now, he said here in verse 16, he said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Which trump? The last trump. The furthest one out is when Christ will come, the seventh trump. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why would they rise first, Brother Randall? Why wouldn't it be more important to, uh, well, uh, take those that's on the earth first? Well, <laughs> first and foremost, we're not going anywhere. The majority of the people believe that they're going to a faraway star or they're going to go off into a, uh, the galaxy and, and live in a kingdom. The kingdom of Christ Jesus, the thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ Jesus, will be right here on terra firma, right here on earth. This is what God had planned from the beginning. And why somebody would want to believe that they're going to go somewhere when the scriptures plainly tell us that we will be here in the kingdom of Christ. Now, he said here that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why will they rise first? Because they are already with him. They are already with the Lord. In Luke's gospel, chapter 16, it talks about paradise. And it talks about which side of the gulf one would be on. Regardless which side, they are with the Lord. Now, those that are on the side where Abraham, the side of glory, these are those that will come with the Lord. They will come and fight with Christ. You say, will there be a battle? It won't be much of a battle. It won't be much of a, uh, a, a need of battle. The, the battle will be before the coming of the Lord. The battle will be a spiritual warfare. And it will be for the election to prove that they have studied the word of God. That's the reason why we are continuing. And, and you say, well, I believe I've heard this message before. It's not going to be the same message, but I have used these scriptures many times. And to bring out the understanding of when the Lord will come. The biggest confusion of people today is that they listen to man and they do not take God's word for what it says. First and foremost, listen to me and listen well. First and foremost, you must have a King James Version Bible. If you have anything other than a King James Version Bible, then you will be misled because the words have been translated and changed to conform to an idea that the Kenites have brought out. Verse 17, he said, Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is one of the most confusing scriptures to the rapturist because they have heard through revival and through uh, camp and through Bible school and through Sunday school, how that this scripture is the one where we will all be called up in the air with the Lord. Let me take a moment and translate this for you. It says, then we which are alive and remain, in other words, still here on the earth, <laughs> and that's, that's where the rapture is make their mistake. He says, and it, uh, remain and shall be caught up together. In other words, all of us, 1 Corinthians 15, will change in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, caught up together with them in the clouds. Well, you see there, Brother Randall, they're going to the clouds. Hold your finger right there for just a moment. And if we look at Hebrews chapter 12, I want to give you a lesson real quick 
on the word clap. Now, what Paul has done He has used Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. He has used this colloquial Greek, in other words, a street talk, per se, and used this word clouds, and it confuses many people. Now, it's not meant that to be confusing. Paul didn't do it to confuse anybody. But he has also used this same concept in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which do so easily beset us. Let us run our, uh, with patience the race that is set before us. In other words, this cloud, have you ever seen a marathon have you ever seen a, a, a bunch of people gathered together to getting ready to run a marathon race? That's what it is. It's a large group of people. And that's what this word cloud means. A large group of people. So he says here back in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17, he says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. In other words, we will all be together this great large amount of people to meet the Lord in the air. Now you see there, Brother Randall, we're going in the air. We're going to all go up in there to the air. That's not what this scripture is saying. This word air in the Greek is pneuma. And it means a breath of life. In other words, we are going to be in the spirit. We are no longer going to carry this old flesh shell around. We are all going to be in the spirit. So, now that we've got this out of the bag, we're going to say it again. It says, then we which are alive and remain and caught up together with them in this large group of people to meet the Lord in the breath of life, so shall we ever be with the Lord. In other words, you'll never put back on this flesh. You'll never have need for this flesh again. And that's all he's saying. In verse number 18, he said, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This words should be comforting. The words that Paul has used should be a comfort to you to let you know that uh, there's not going to be an any moment doctrine. You're not going to be standing there working or doing whatever and all of a sudden just be gone. That's not going to happen that way. In verse 17, he said that we are caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. If you look over in Revelation chapter 20, this is what you are to do. Chapter 20 and verse number 6. The scriptures say, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Friends, if you are following along in the way of God like you ought to, studying God's word, preparing your family and yourself, planting a few seeds here and there as you go, and know that the Antichrist comes first, the instead of Christ, the, the opposite of Jesus, the anti knowing that he will come first and that it will not have any effect on you. Why? Because Revelations 9 and 5 says that we are sealed in our foreheads. We understand the way that Father has written it out for you and I. So, he says here again, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. What is the second death, Brother Randall? The second death comes at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. All of us will be in that kingdom. Depending on what your status was when you uh, left this earth, how you believed and what is sealed in your mind, 
will determine whether or not you are part of this first resurrection. Now he says here, and on such the second death hath no part. Those that are found unworthy after the millennial reign of Christ, in other words, after a thousand years of teaching and that thousand years of discipline, meaning that 999 years, I said that just because that's what we are looking at in a barometer. The majority of the time that we are there with Christ in the millennium, Satan will not be there. His horde of angels will not be there. And he will not be there. The only time that he is there is when he is loosened for a season. And that to tempt those one more time, to draw one more time, the wheat and the tares, the separation of, he will draw one more time and try to get those who have no desire to follow God's ways. And he will take them and they all will be well, what the Bible says here, and the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him a thousand years. So we see here in 1 Thessalonians that the rapturists have got this all twisted around, and they've got people believing in a false hope, believing in something that, well, is not going to happen. I'm going to do it. First, let's go over to Ezekiel chapter 13 real quick. Ezekiel chapter 13, and I want you to see exactly what Father says about this. And this is how I bring it out. If Father is against it, wouldn't you be against it? Amen. You, you should. If you are a student of the Word of God, and you have a desire to, to follow God's way and, and to love all the things that God then you would follow God's scripture. In Ezekiel 13, in verse number 18, this goes directly to uh, those that are teaching the rapture theory. He says, and say, in other words, this is God speaking to Ezekiel, he says, and say, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the women that sow pillows to all armholes and to make kerchiefs upon the head of every statue to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people, and will you save the souls alive that come to you? In other words, he's saying here that woe unto the women, women, an example of the bride of Christ. He's talking to the bride of Christ. Those that have accepted Christ as their personal Savior. That's who he's talking to. He said, the women that sow pillows, in other words, false doctrines, to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature. And now, this stature is your high places. And this kerchief covers up the outstretched hand of God. God's grace is upon you and I today. For whomsoever will come, let him come. And whomsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But with this doctrine, they put a covering over the outstretched hand of God, and they make as it is as if that uh, uh, you've got to uh, uh, be in their plan. You've got to believe along their lines. Go to verse nineteen. God asks, "And will you pollute me?" among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, in other words, for money or for service, to slay the souls that should not die, giving out false hope. In other words, slaying these people, putting them back into bondage, and to save the souls alive that should not live by your lying to my people that hear your lies. Father is not happy with it. Verse 20 is why I came. 
Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, in other words, your false doctrines, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. And again, if you had any other version of Scripture, of Bible, other than a King James Version, it may be talking to you about uh, birds flying in the air. But that's not what this Scripture is talking about. You see, Father knew that way before Margaret MacDonald came along, that this rapture theory would be a part of a deception in God's children, in the kingdom. And he had prophesied with Ezekiel way before it ever came about. And he said here in 20 again, Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that you hunt to make them fly. How will he do that? Through his word. Ezekiel chapter 37, the Bible talks about how that Ezekiel is there, and the Lord asked him, he said, what do you see? He said, I see a valley of dead, dry bones. He said, will these bones live again? He said, uh, you know, Lord. He said, what I want you to do, I want you to prophesy to these bones. What does it mean to prophesy? It means teach the word of God. Teach them what thus saith God's word. Now, once they began to hear the truth of God's word, the Bible says that sinew become on sinew, and in other words, muscle and bone come to bone, and, and, and skin came on. They became alive again. They were no longer spiritually dead. This rapture theory is a dangerous thing. And it leaves people with the false hope and not to study the word of God. Many of your rapture doctrine believers, uh, they won't even read the book of the Revelation because they're so convinced in their mind that they won't be here and that it has no need for that. I guess that would be true if you were going to be just taken out midterm, but that's not what the scriptures teach. And it is a big misconception amongst God's children. Our brothers and sisters, our loved ones, our friends and our family that believe along these lines. So back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Why will it come as a thief in the night, Brother Randall? You just told me that uh, we are to wait upon the Lord. It will only come in the thief as a thief in the night for those that are not prepared for the coming of the Lord. If you are not aware, or if you've not been told, or if you have not studied along the lines, then it would be a shocker to you. It would be something that you would uh, uh, will not understand. But that is why that Timothy had said that we are to study to show ourselves approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if we do these things, we are prepared. We're prepared for the coming of the Lord. Now, verse number three, he says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. <coughs> Excuse me. This peace and safety is spoken about in Daniel chapter number eight. Let's look. Daniel chapter eight. In Daniel chapter 8, in verse number 25, let's read, uh, let's, let's read up there just a little bit. Let's, uh, let's go to verse 24. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Whose power? The Antichrist's. This one that comes before our Savior comes. Let me, let me 
at this end. Nobody's going to miss this boat. It's going to happen. It's going to happen and it's going to affect every living soul on earth. And it's also going to affect every soul that is with Christ. So he says here, <clears throat> and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. In other words, he gets his power from whom? From God. God is always in control. Wouldn't it be better to follow God than it is to follow the traditions of man? Wouldn't it be better to follow God's words than to follow what a man has taught? Oh, well, I've heard this all my life. How old are you? Are you 6,000 years old? Are you old enough to understand all of God's word? No, friend. Uh, at your best, you're 70, 80, whatever. Therefore, you have not learned what God wants you to learn. He says here, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Who are these mighty and holy people? Those that have claimed Christ as their Savior, but yet they get destroyed because they do not study the Word. They do not know to wait out for the true Christ. They are taken out of season. They are taken midterm. Pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath, Matthew chapter 24. Why does he say that? Because you do not harvest in the winter. You do not do any several work on the Sabbath. So you pray that your time comes when the harvest is full. When it's time to take. That's what Christ does when it's time. Verse 25. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Did you see that? The peace that he will call is exactly what we're read here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. It says, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman. In other words, the labor pain, the pain that comes. Why is that? It's because they did not wait upon the true Christ. When the Antichrist comes, he will be supernatural. Lucifer will be supernatural. And he will be able to do miracles in the sights of men. He will be able to call down fire from heaven in the book of the Revelation. He'll snap his fingers and these things will all come about. It will amaze the people of the flesh that have never studied along these lines. But for God's election, God's chosen, those that have studied, it will not be a shocker. It'll only be an event that we will mark off the calendar and prepare ourselves for the next event come. Again, in 25, he said, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper. This craft he's talking about is in Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to read it to you. Chapter 13 and verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war against the saints and overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. He has that power because God has given it to him. It's not meant for you to be afraid and scared, for it is God that is orchestrating all of this. You say, well, I don't understand that. Why would God do that? I'm going to get to that here just in a little bit. But again, he says, and through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of peace, but he shall be broken without hands. He'll stand up against Christ, 
but he'll be broken without Christ even laying one finger on him. Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we see that this peace and safety is nothing more than a lie because there will not be any peace and there will not be any safety until the kingdom, until Christ comes. Now, the biggest misconception is, is that people will believe through his revival that they are in the kingdom. They will believe that they are in Christ's kingdom at that time. The way for you to understand that is that you can pinch yourself and feel it, then you know good and well that you are not in Christ's kingdom, that you are still alive in the flesh. And therefore, it makes him a liar. From Genesis all the way to the book of the Revelation, he has tried to distort God's word. He's tried to distort the bloodline. He has tried to distort everything that God has done. And he has been first on the scene in every event. Knowing that, that he comes first. The Antichrist comes first before the coming of the Lord. So back in here in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse number 4, he said, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You aren't blind. You aren't in the dark. Because you know when Christ comes. And it's not going to take you like a thief has caught you with your head turned. You're going to have your eyes focused from the youngest even to the eldest, are going to be prepared and ready, those that have studied along God's way. Verse 5. He said, Ye are all the children of life and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We have nothing to do with darkness. We are not of Satan. We are of Father. Yahweh, who gives us understanding and clarity through his word. Verse number six. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, why would they put sleep in there? Verse seven. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunk are drunken in the night. This, in verse 6, therefore let us not sleep. This is spoken about in Isaiah chapter 29, in verse number 10. I'm going to read it to you. Isaiah 29 and 10. I'll start at verse number 9. Isaiah 29 and 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out. And cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Verse 10, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Who? The prophets and the rulers. That means the whole world is blind. That's how easy it's going to be for the Antichrist to come and take the whole world. He's going to have the whole world whoring after him. As in a rock star or a politician or somebody famous, how people just flock to him. That's exactly how it's going to be. They're going to be ignorant to the word. Now, we use this word here, deep sleep, for a reason. If we look back in chapter in verse 6 of Thessalonians, it says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others. These others that he's talking about is in Romans chapter 11. Turn with me to Romans 11. You need this scripture right here. Romans 11. And 
And we'll start about verse number seven. It says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. That's you, my friends. You have obtained the understanding. You have obtained the word of God. You have been through the course of teaching, and you know how these events transpire. He said, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. The rest of the people of the world were blinded. Verse number 8, according as it, as it is written. Now, where is it written at? In Isaiah chapter 29. That's what we just read. He said, as it was written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. He has put a spirit upon these people for a protection. And that protection is, is that they would not blaspheme the Holy Spirit when the day comes in that for them to be used. God will only use uh, that one that is sealed in their mind. Those that have the word of God sealed in their forehead. And he said here, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of, some, spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. They won't listen to you, friend. I've got of every size and shape and denomination that you can think of that I have talked to, but none will listen. Why is that? It's because of what's said here. That they have been given a spirit of slumber. Verse 9, and David saith, let their table be a, made a snare. In other words, where they eat, where do you eat at? I hope you eat at your table. And when you eat at your table, it should be good food. It should be food that will nourish you and help you. It's not meant for you to come through the doors of the house of God and leave more confused than you were when you came. Paul said that we are to get off the milk and get onto the meat of the word. That we are to understand what is being taught and that we ought to be taught something. When you are vibrant and you are alive and you are uh, taking in God's word, it's a blessing, my friend. It's something that, uh, well, your spirit longs for. So he said, David said, let their table be a snare and a trap and a stumbling block. And a recompense unto them. That stumbling block is where they get fed. He said, let it be that. Let it be that way to them. Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. That load gets very heavy if you're not in tune with God's word. It gets real heavy at the end. So back in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, again, in verse number 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Remember Isaiah 29? He said that they're drunken, in their, but they haven't been drinking. They stagger, but they're not intoxicated. They slip and they slide and they do not understand because they will not allow God's Spirit to teach them. Verse number 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet the hope of salvation. When the Antichrist comes, he will not be alone. Turn with me over to Joel chapter number 2. In the prophecy of Joel, you got Hosea and then Joel, chapter number 2. <clears throat> when Christ has told many of us in his scriptures, that these are coming. We ought to be aware. 
The Antichrist is going to have his power, but he's going to have many that will come and do his work for him. And this is who we're going to read about in Joel 2. Joel 2 and 1, it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. I hope. I hope that your church is blowing a trumpet. I hope your church is sounding an alarm. Because, friends, it is something that is missed throughout all of the teachings. It's not a warning. It should be a warning to people. People should know. If they send out the FCA, send out a, a, a drug, they put a warning label on that. And if the poison control sends out a, a product, they put a warning label on that. If you handle something that may harm you, there is a warning label on that. There is a warning label on this, and it's for a reason. He said, blow you the trumpet. Verse number two. He said, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. This is something that people ought to be aware of. But the rapturists do not even involve themselves in this equation. They do not even realize that the Antichrist, when he comes, he is going to bring an army with him. These are the angelics that will come with Lucifer when he comes. This day of darkness and gloominess, darkness is always of deception. You don't know and you can't see in the darkness. Amen? You must always have a light. That's why we are the children of light. And that to guide in that day. The day of darkness and gloominess and the clouds and a thick darkness. And this is some strong deception. Some strong deception will come. As the morning spread upon the mountains. And he talks about a great people, strong. That there hath not ever been like, neither shall there be any more after it into the years of the generations. Who are these people, Brother Randall? Keep your finger in Joel and turn with me to Revelation chapter number 9. Revelation chapter number 9, verse number 1. He said here in verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. The supernatural happenings. Three. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, he's not talking about locusts, insects. And he's not talking about scorpion insects invading the world. He is saying that these supernatural angelics, when they come, they will come in such a great number that it will appear like locusts and they will devour everything in their sight. And the scorpions, he brings out this in the scorpions, this is in Ezekiel chapter 2, how that <clears throat> these scorpions, when they come, they will 
supernaturally paralyze uh, their victims. Those who do not have the seal of God in their forehead. Those who are waiting on a rapture theory. You see, that's what the Antichrist will be preaching at that time. He is going to come with a loving idea of saying, you know, there are so many that are not on this band. What I want to do is wait out a little while before I rapture you away. And I need you to go to your family and go to your friends and do all you can to persuade them. And that's exactly how they will be deceived. He said here in verse number three, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth had power. Four, and it was commanded them. Who was their commander? God. God is in control. He said, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing nor any tree. Now, why is that? Because the scripture is used ahead of that as locusts. And they're not to be a part of that. They are not here to destroy the earth. But they are here to get your soul. They are after the souls of man. He said, any green thing nor any tree, but only those men and women and children which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. What is the seal of God, Brother Randall? <laughs> it's where God teaches you the word through his Holy Spirit, and it seals it in your mind. And nothing, nothing of this world can change it. Verse 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. The torture. So back in Joel chapter 2, we see here that in verse number 5, excuse me, let's go back to 4. It says the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. In other words, power. And as horsemen, so shall they run. Five, like the noise of chariots on tops of the mountain shall they leap. I'll just throw this in here for those who like to read and study a little more. Read Ezekiel chapter 1. See how God came. It might enlighten you to Believe how they will come. It says, The noise of the chariots of the, on top of the mountain shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Verse 6. Before their face, the people shall be much pained. Did you see that? Who's going to be much pained? All of those who have not the seal of God in their forehead, they are tormented for five months. Tormented in what way? Tormented in not knowing the truth and listening to lies. He said, before their face, the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. This blackness is the paleness in their face. When they realize what they've done, that they have went for the wrong Christ. Many of your rationists today know that they are to be true to Christ. They know that they love the Lord, and but yet their doctrine is turned around because they will not listen to God's word. They would rather listen to traditions of man. They would rather listen to the man behind the podium than listen to God's word. Why, I don't want to take any credit for it. I'm reading what thus saith God's word and doing my best to comply with what the scriptures give in the Hebrew or in the Greek. 
That's the only thing that I am here to do, is to teach. Verse 7, then shall they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. This is a very disciplined military. A very disciplined army. They won't break their ranks. Kind of like what God said about the house of Rahab. How that they were disciplined. Verse 8, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. What sword are you talking about, Brother Renner? Are we going to be able to kill them? No, no, no. You ain't going to be able to kill them. What he's talking about here is in Revelation chapter number 1, In verse number 16, it says, And he, being Christ, had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This sword is the word of God. So in other words, when an election were to come up against one of these and try to put them in their place, by using the word of God, it will not have any effect on them. They will not listen to what you have to say. Verse number nine. Then shall run, they shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Who are you talking about, Brother Randall? Turn with me to Jude. That's right before Revelation. Jude. The book of Jude. In the book of Jude in verse number four. It says here, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into last covetousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the angelics that are going to come. You say, well, Brother Randall, what are we to do? What are we to do? You are to read your word. You are to know how these events will transpire. And turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Many of you know exactly where I'm going. You are to have on the full armor of God. That's the only way that you will withstand anything that comes down the path from the Antichrist. He said in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the whales of the devil. The whales of the devil. His soothing talk his lies that will come out of his mouth. He will try his best to utilize scripture and twist it all around. For somebody that doesn't know God's scripture that well, it will sound just beautiful. But for the election, for God's chosen, those that have studied along these ways, they will know and they will catch every word that he twists. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, in other words, this battle, friends, in the end times, is not going to be against flesh and blood. It's not going to be a war of bombs and guns, but a spiritual warfare. It's what you believe to be the truth. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a very serious warfare. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What day is that? It's right before the coming of the Lord. It's right before in the 
in, in the sixth trump, right before the coming of the Lord. And the evil day, and have done all to stand. Verse 14, he said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. This girt that you have is something that holds your pants up, men. This is something that you're supposed to use. Now, if you look for a side study, if you'll look over in Jeremiah chapter 13, you'll read about this rotten girt, this rotten girdle that God has talked to Jeremiah about. And it's of the word, how that it is not the truth, how that there is so many lies that go out of God's word. And people latch on to these things. So we said here that we are to have our loins girt about with truth, the true word of God, not a fabrication, not a, a theory, but the truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, and that breastplate of righteousness is the authority of God's word. This is God's word in all the authority. And it has power. It has power to put them in their place. 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This gospel of peace is given to you in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. This is the peace that you're supposed to have because you are already pre-warned. Verse 16, this is most important. Above all, taking the shield of faith. In other words, wavering not. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. If you have all of this armor of God, you will be able to withstand all that comes at you. He said that whether you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We are to hear God's word. I'm talking the truth, not a fabrication, not a one horse, one verse Charlie, but all of God's word that helps us to grow. Verse 17, and take the hel helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It is God's word that will protect you. It is the most important thing in a man's life today. People are all concerned about their 401ks and all this retirements and how these things are going to, friend, if you put as much energy in God's word as you do in the things of the world, then we would have a whole lot more that are prepared. Verse 18, he said, Praying always with all prayer and in supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all preser preservation And watching thereunto with all preservance and supplication for all saints. In other words, making it ready, making it available, having it available at that time is what is most important. I wanted to bring out this morning something that would be helpful to the people. Many have heard this along these lines. Many are prepared and studied along the lines that uh, Father has laid out for you and I. But I continue to see many that have heard somewhat of God's word, but they do not take it for granted. They do not take it serious because their minds are stuck on a rapture theory. I hope this morning that the scriptures that we've used have been a help to you. 
Our prayer is, is that God's shaken and wakes up many people through his scriptures, through his word, and that Ezekiel 37 comes to mind, that many people will stand upon their feet on that day and be prepared for the Antichrist. Many other places I could have went this morning, but for the lack of time, we're going to cut it off right there. But I thank you again this morning for listening and being a part of our service. We are entering in into our holiday season, and uh, many people are preparing themselves for this holiday season. And our gift to you was the scriptures that we used this morning, the truth of God's word. We pray it's been a help to you. Let us bow our heads. We're going to pray this morning. Yahweh, we come to you thanking you for another opportunity. We ask, Father, that you put this word out, Father, that many would come to know the truth, and that they would at least consider your words, not mine, but your words, Father, in your scriptures, that they may learn and know and be prepared. Father, we love you and thank you again for all that you do. Go with us now. Lead and God direct us, Father. Until the next time, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be